How's it going, everybody? We're back. Sunday. I hope everyone's having a good day, good evening, wherever you are in uh, the world. So what I was doing here is just reworking um, where we left off or what, what, uh, what I was working on yesterday. <laughs> yes, Julia and Alex, it's good to see you guys. Um, so I just, I had reworked that idea kind of fully, um, like conceptually, I guess. So I just wasn't that happy with um, everything <laughs> yesterday. Um, like the overall motion and results and stuff like that. So what I ended up doing was was uh, re moving the domain around, doing a new terrain, um, and then tweaking my like base particle simulation. So basically starting like from scratch or just just retooling everything. Um, and then with this one, I found that I was getting a lot better because um, I'm like more more optimally using the container, if that makes more sense. Um, I can get more out of my resolution. Because um, like before we, we had a box, but we weren't necessarily using, like filling that much of it with smoke. Um, so I think that helped me a little bit. Um, changing the base motion of the particles made things look a little bit better. Um, but yeah, overall, like it's, it, uh, I think it's, it's working better this way. It just looks, uh, I don't know. It's more, <laughs> it's more successful, I think, because it's like more of an, it gets you into more of an abstract world where it's like, these could be clouds, like it's it's more interesting this way, I think, as before it was like, what's causing this shockwave? Like there's not, there's no um, bomb going off, there's nothing really happening, but I think this could look pretty cool if we just had like a, a different shader on the ground. Um, could do that white, white ground red smoke again or something like that. Um, but I'm gonna kind of put this on hold for right now or for today and just, go over the basics of like uh, col adding color to smoke and some different approaches for it. Um, so I'll put this away. This was just a, a test I was doing, um, cropped in or whatever, w without seeing the ground of that uh, shockwave uh, thing. So what I'm going to do is just grab this node tree and use it as a starting point again. We'll do a new new scene. So I was actually planning to to, to go in with Redshift um, and and test that out a little bit with the shaders. So. I think this, it might be a Redshift uh, 3.0 feature, but they did add support for the color channel. So we'll be trying that out a little bit. Um, and I did put in the description, not that one. Um, my, in my panels of the Twitch channel, I added a, uh, I updated my version or the, the plugin version of uh, Redshift. So we should get some better features in terms of volume support it might be a little bit better um we'll we'll figure it out and see what happens yeah you have to have a color field um i think that's i mean so you can do um i think if you change this tint like you globally you're just changing the color of the smoke um we'll figure it out when we get more more into the shading process of things but um yeah, I think that you can supply a color field. So you're, you think version 3021? Should I switch to 3021 or it has problems? Because I haven't been... Um, I haven't been hitting any problems with 3020.
with the ver the version that I'm on or with this this 3021 <laughs> you're, t you're telling me I'm I'm in for problems okay good I got lucky then <laughs> So uh, we'll just keep this the same. I ran into other problems on my other um, render node that I have here. I had to like completely reinstall Linux because um, the version of, of Linux that I had on it was so old it wouldn't support like the latest NVIDIA drivers that I needed for, um, for, for that version of Redshift. So I had to like completely reinstall Linux, but it's just a, a render node so it wasn't a big deal because I don't use like the graphical interface and everything of it. So sometimes I do this just to bake in that wireframe uh, visualization. They released an official statement. This is like uh, everyone's statements on various crises and they're releasing their statement on... Uh... Let me get this on the other window. <laughs> our statement on the crash that we <laughs> incurred on all of our user base. Okay, cool. So we should be good with, I'll just leave everything here with um, 3020 and we sh hopefully we're, we're in good shape. So I'm gonna do a taller container, like a little bit thinner. Um, I'm gonna set up two sources and then this is gonna be like a, our little test bed to just shoot some fluids, some smoke around. Um, sometimes I do this to just make sure that things are like above the ground plane or whatever. So now we have a box that's just sitting uh, above the, the floor. Um, and then this first input here, the, because I've copied this over, um, it's looking for our different particles with attributes. So it has some problems right now. Um, we don't need the terrain stuff anymore. And I'm gonna get this wind back to defaults. And with these closed, you could do either one. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so that that one should be good. Looks like we're at a pretty high resolution for right now. So just to set things up, I'm gonna go down to a little bit lower quality. Um, so we should be good. I'm just gonna add some particle sources now. So I'm going to do start off with just like a classic scenario uh, with two jets, two turbulent jets mixing. You guys ever look at the uh, like <laughs> fluid lab research? If you uh, they they name these things funny sometimes. They'll they'll name these like ducted turbulent jets like they. They, they go in the laboratories and study these like situations or scenarios or whatever very um, very in depth or very I don't know carefully. So they, they they come up with interesting names for them or whatever. They have like the mixing of two laminar flows or uh, things things like that that I, I I don't know. I always find it funny. So we'll do. maybe a couple circles um, just get one move it a little bit off of the bottom yeah it looks <laughs> it looks complicated but sometimes they're interested in different aspects of of things it's it's interesting to look at the comparison of like research based fluid mechanics versus visual effects based fluid mechanics um, just because they're interested in very, they don't ever care like visually if it looks interesting or not. They're just trying to get accurate results. Um, I think that there was like some collaboration that the OpenVDB people did with, um, 
maybe SpaceX. I think that there's a, this is like a presentation that they did on it or whatever. Um, they have some footage and stuff like that that they found. Uh, and then their actual, <laughs> like their actual results don't look too, too interesting because they just don't care that much about like that aspect of things. But it is massively uh, data heavy stuff or whatever. But um, it's yeah, it's just always interesting to kind of see what people in other fields are using fluid studies and stuff like that for. So I think at the end, they they actually tried to render something and make it look like pretty good, but it didn't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how well it worked out for them. But uh, it, it's it's interesting to see what what other uses are applied and like sometimes you can see some some interesting stuff. But it's, it's cool to to check out. So these circles are going to be our sources. We'll merge. We'll get one at the top of our container. So we have a height of five. Um, so you just do five minus. Do like an expression. Um, and then I'm going to set these to polygons. We're doing particles for our source. Yeah, it's a, it's a good reference just even for trying to set up different, um, doing testing and stuff like that, like setting up wind tunnels and, and checking your results to see if they are like somewhat physically accurate. So these guys, we want them to be polygons. Um, maybe I didn't set this up in the most like procedural sense. I could have just done like reference copies of my notes or whatever, but we're not too worried about it. Um, so we'll just move those guys pretty small and we'll just add our attributes that we need for things. Sometimes if you want to be sure that you have the right like visualization, you do delete geometry, but keep the points. Um, so, because we're not sourcing like faces or whatever, we're just doing the, the particles. And then, the song was getting a little bit too intense for <laughs> the start of the stream. Maybe at the end when the the effect is actually done, we get we get good results. We'll play that one. So we'll do P scale, and uh, usually I just do that. The D key, do display as disks, uh, and then you can just visualize the actual like world object space radius or whatever of your your particles, uh, and then we just can do temperature. Um, the one and uh, density the one so we have the scale for the points we have uh, density and temperature attributes and then we probably just want velocity so we can just do that uh, with some more wrangles to do it quickly. So this one we'll just do up. And this one, point it down. So stuff should be happening. <laughs> We've, uh, we got somewhere. So I'm going to just add a light to my scene. Uh, just so we're actually getting some uh, shadows. You can just visualize the structure and stuff like that of our smoke a little bit more. So it looks like our radius might be a little bit too small. Um, losing some of the velocity. 
I'm just gonna go into these. Crunch, crunch down the threshold so it's less blurry of a source. Basically that makes it either the source is on or off. It's There's no like in-between. So I don't know why we're, oh, okay. I've, I've figured this one out. So with the buoyancy, um, we kind of have stuff counteracting each other. So just turn that off for now. It's basically both of these were treated as hot sources, but then the overall buoyancy was like having a, a bigger effect on everything. Turn that stuff back off for now. Uh, I think you could do sparse pyro with this this kind of effect. Um, it is <clears throat> a generally like a rectangular or box shaped effect, so it's not um, not necessarily optimized or like I don't know how the gains that you would get for doing sparse wouldn't be that great. Um, to me, I would only go to uh, pyro if I, or sparse pyro if I was doing like missile trails, fireworks, like mortars, or things like that that are like curved and go in a bunch of different space. Because then you can just simulate like those lines or those curves essentially instead of like big boxes everywhere. Um, so stuff that's like traveling a, a really far distance and isn't aligned to an axis like you can't fit it inside of a box because it's bending or curving or whatever those those are the best for sparse pyro um so we have our jets mixing hitting each other but they they aren't um terribly turbulent right now and they aren't going that fast so if i just go in here with velocity uh, source pre-molt, this is just where you can multiply the magnitude of the velocity before it's actually added. So pre-molt is like before it's considered. If you did uh, the destination pre-molt, that's like the velocity field that's currently existing in your simulation. So it's with this kind of source, you don't want to mess with these other ones because then you, you're basically like amping up the simulation of everything, each frame. These are going faster, hitting each other. Boom. Um, they aren't too... There isn't a lot of turbulence right now, so we can add that just with the, the gas turbulence node. Um, I might turn... I'm gonna turn one of these off just to dial this in or just to, to illustrate it um, a little bit more clearly. So I'll pin the view so you can still get the shadows and stuff like that. And then um, you can just use this turbulence, put it into velocity. I'm gonna copy my OpenCL setting just to, so the turbulence is generated on open, using OpenCL, using the graphics card. Um, so this bindings is somewhat important. The density field here is basically saying only add turbulence or inject turbulence in within this region. Um, then you see this influence threshold. This is what's linked to that density. So it's basically saying anything, um, that any, any uh, value that's below this of your density field, don't add turbulence there. You could control it further with a um, control field as well. But this is one thing, like if you have it blank or if you don't have a density field, it would look like your turbulence isn't working and it could be a problem. Um, so it kind of looks like it's working, but I think it's just a little bit too, too big, like the scale of the swirls. 
So if I look at my division size, uh, my voxel size is 0 0.02. Um, the swirl size of this stuff is much bigger than that. So it's like 0.65, which might be like that big or, or somewhere around there. Um, let's just go to 0.1. Maybe 0.15. You maybe want this guy like 10 times bigger than your voxel size, uh, just as like a rule of thumb or a starting point. So now we're adding smaller details that will get like peeled off and stuff like that. Whereas before we were just doing like large scale um, curves or like bulges or whatever. That makes sense. Um, Sometimes what I do here is you do temperature for your control field. So this is kind of like the buoyancy model of applying this, this uh, turbulence. So it's like maybe there's other chemicals mixing or hot areas or something like that within your, your smoke that are maybe combusting or like something's happening that's causing stuff to blow around. Um, we could make the scale higher. So it's like when there's smoke or explosions or stuff like that, there's like a bunch of chemical reactions happening all the time throughout it. But we're just simulating like one field. So with turbulence or, or things like that, you're kind of baking those other um, effects. So I think my temperature field is quite low. Um, sometimes it's a good idea just to like really slam these values to make sure that they're working um, and then ease back or pull back on them a little bit. We'll go down to six. Adding the temperature control field, you kind of get something where like, hopefully these features rip off and then they just sit, sit still, kind of. Um, so you think just up, uh, upping the turbulence to four overall is pretty good? So I, I am pretty high at six, but I, I think that it's also getting multiplied. Like this is essentially saying multiply it by this remapped velocity field. Not this turbulence, a different turbulence. You have some secret turbulence model that you're using. Oh, the the swirl size. Let me see. You're talking about the um, oh this one. Yeah, so this that's useful as well because you're this is how many octaves the um, the noise will produce. So if you layer this, it does have the effect of making the overall like noise amount stronger. Um, and then you can get some smaller details as well. So we're getting something, we're, get, we're getting somewhere. Um, things are, we're pretty certain about how things are working like set up properly so we could go to a higher resolution for right now. Um, so I'll just press the D key, turn off that resolution. Um, I think we're good with, with everything else that we're doing right now. So we'll take a look at uh, what we get. So we're not using too much GPU memory or VRAM. Um, we could increase that if we wanted to, but for right now, it just makes sense to keep keep things playing back. We're still pretty close to like real time, so it's good to to keep working quickly for right now. Um, so we might we might want to add some vortex confinement or something like that, just so that these 
those guys don't completely stop. Um, I'm gonna reduce the soil size of everything. Um, this pulse length, I might make it a little bit quicker, so it's, the noise will, the, the length of the pulses are quicker, like there are shorter gaps between them, so the noise is updating faster. So always this can be misleading of a parameter to, to tweak. Um, and then my control settings, I'm just going to make my minimum a little bit lower, because I still want like the areas that aren't that dense or aren't that thick, I still want them to move around or get hit by the turbulence a little bit. So there's many different approaches that people have for for adding color to smoke sims. Um, the, the most straightforward one, I'm not going to do it right now, but um, you can just have multiple density fields. So you have like basically these are separate volumes um, and then you can just set globally like the two colors for those. But what I'm going to be trying to do is using particles to um, like store the color and then uh, transfer it over inside of using like a volume. So there also is this color um, there's this new feature that they added in Houdini 17.5, where you can have colored volumes um, that go along with your your simulation. But I'm not a big fan of using those because um, the color is three channels, like RGB, so it's three volumes or three. It's like having three more densities, um, so it just adds a lot more fields a lot more voxels like total or just a lot more data to your your simulation so i tried to keep it going pretty lightweight um but what i'll do is add this object merge um so this guy let's see if this drag and drop works today it's just a little slow i guess so this guy i'll use it to get the velocity so now we have the three directions, X, Y, and Z. Um, then I'm just gonna convert those to VDB. This is like similar to what I did in an earlier stream where I was building like a simple uh, particle advection solver. Um, so now these are VDB volumes instead of just Houdini dense volumes. Um, then you do a vector merge. The Houdini tools like to know that this is a vector three uh, volume instead of three individual floats. It's like the same data, it's just different ways of, of storing it or representing it. And usually I just will mark that there. This warning that that's, it's uh, talking about, you don't really have to worry about it. Um, basically when these fluid sims run, you can't you can't see it, but the velocity grids are like slightly offset. Um, and this is just saying that they have diff they're in different positions, essentially. So it comes from the, this one is set to um, velocity sample to faces. That basically means that it will be, the, the center of the different voxels will be offset slightly. You could set it to center, um, and then this warning will go away. It won't complain anymore. But they use faces because it's a better method for handling like collisions and things like that. We're not doing like colliding with a solid object. We're not doing it in that, that situation, so we could leave it at centered if we want. Um, so I think maybe this turbulence strength overall is a bit high go down to 1.75 so this, everything was just getting a little bit too broken up or too mushy or whatever so this is looking a little bit better um, and then I can just create particles where my my source uh, shapes are 
So what I can do is scatter. So I want to scatter before that add node. This one needs surfaces to actually scatter on. Um, we'll turn off those other relaxation stuff. I'm going to go out of the disks just into points. I'm going to have a lot more particles here. Sometimes I use the density scale, so it's like points per surface area. So if your emission sources are like changing size, you you're still evenly like representing the same amount of points per area, essentially. Um, and then inside of a solver, this will be the particles velocity in that input. Maybe it will make uh, more sense to move everything over here. Just to keep the lines a little bit straighter. Um, and then I'm just going to add a color to my points. So there's different ways. You could add the color before you scatter them, uh, and it would inherit it from the surface color. But it just depends what you want to do. And then I'm going to do bounding box. So this will just take like the 3D bounding box position um, and transfer that into color. So with X, it goes from 0 to 1 in the X direction, Y, 0 to 1, um, Z, 0 to 1, or whatever. Because these are so far apart, we can get different colors, interesting colors that way. Um, and then I'm just going to do a merge. So this will take the previous frames, scattered particles, and merge them with uh, the input. Will basically act like a source. So every frame will add these particles and pump these particles into the solver. And then going to do the advect points. This is, that was the wrong one. So this one does geometry. The other one I had was for advecting uh, volumes. And then you'd see we're advecting, but because we just have one sub-step, we're using a bad integrator, um, we get some errors. So if we get, increase the sub-steps, they'll more clearly follow the velocity. And then usually just go up to one of these Rungakata. Rung one of these German inter German mathematicians came up with it. I don't. I, I might be pronouncing that name wrong. Um, then I think we're okay for right now. So when I'm playing this back, you'll notice it's a little bit slower than um, it was actually visualizing the smoke. So that's because I'm fetching the velocities which is more information to be exchanging from the uh, DOP network than just visualizing this stuff can play back faster because you're not uh, pulling as much information out of the DOP net. That's why it's, it gets a little bit slower to, to fetch the velocity, but it's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, and then I'm going to change the seed. So if I just do dollar sign FF, this is, we'll just make sure that these get new random distributions each frame. So when I play it and I'm sourcing everything, um, then it, it will just be a more like stochastic, random, randomly sampled uh, distribution. If you do, if you don't update that, sometimes they'll just keep going from the same source location that you kind of get like strings. If you're making strings, it can be a good idea to do um, to do that. But what I want, what I'm trying to do here, is just have these particles kind of evenly fill or or represent our our volumes. Um, I'll just save it. So this is um, we we made some progress. It would be a shame to lose it. Go into the new folder. All right. 
So we want to get, looks like I, it's, it's redoing the simulation. It's like when you change the hip name, it will recalculate the simulation for whatever reason. Um, so we want to transfer those, the color of those particles to volumetric data. We have, looks like this guy needs to be um, re, the recached as well. We just have, I'm doing this because points is a lightweight way to represent the color information. So we just have 2,600 or 2,700 um, points with color attributes. It just takes like less than 200 kilobytes. You could, you could store this on a floppy disk if, if you know what that. You'd store it very easily. It doesn't take a lot of memory. It doesn't take a lot of disk, hard disk space. Um, with these volumes, like this is what I was saying. These are three vectors. So color, we would need R, G, and B. Um, this guy is like 200 megabytes. So we go from 200 megabytes to 200 kilobytes just to represent uh, different different types of data or whatever. This is why I, I set this up this way, basically. Um, but now we, for rendering purposes and visualization purposes, we need to make a volume out of them. Um, so we have a few different options. Uh, one of the easiest ways is just, you can do a volume um, like this. Doesn't, maybe it will matter eventually what we plug it into, but for right now, um, I'm just gonna have it fill the entire domain. Could do this as well maybe that's a little bit more optimized um for the size <laughs> you had pokemon on a floppy disk was the actual game boy rom you were trying to connect up or you were trying to just use it with emulators so instead of scalar we want this to be vector we'll just name it cd for color um, and then there's a pretty nice node that you can use that's um, just called volume from attribute. So not attribute from volume, that's going the other way. Volume from attribute. You'll notice some of these parameters look the same as that like gas particle to field. Um, all those are, they use similar terminology because they're doing similar stuff. So right now it's not picking up everything. We could just set this now to CD for color. Um, and then we should be filling things up. So the default visualization methods for smoke isn't that easy, it's easy to see or it doesn't work that well. If you do slice, then you can see that I'm um, like able to actually see the, the RGB values inside of this field instead of this way. Um, if you do want to visualize it as a 3D volume, then you just do this volume visualization and diffuse fields, you just use that uh, drop down. Um, the only problem is we don't have our density stuff anymore. So I can just do merge, pop it in, I believe, like that. So I might need this one to be temperature. Um, that th I'm just gonna rename it to be density. I think even for, for Redshift and rendering stuff, eventually it will, it will be better to name it density. So you'll kind of see what's happening. Like this is why I was saying it's not a big deal to to have this resolution of this volume to be a little bit low or sparse. I guess like a coarse resolution. Um, all the shadows and lighting and stuff will happen on the the actual temperature, the the higher resolution of the simulation. Um, and then the silhouettes, like the edges, it just gets like pre-multiplied, kind of like a mask or an alpha channel or whatever. So even though 
these look to be quite blurry, um, we can kind of get away with it. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a little bit un unconventional, maybe. Um, so move up in resolution a little bit and just do a play, play, uh, play blast or flip book and see what happens. So if you're deving or doing new techniques for simulations using these point-based methods, um, it's usually a good idea to check animation and uh, motion and stuff like that, just to make sure you don't get like flickering or other artifacts um, of that nature. So like with this approach, if you don't have enough particles or points, um, things can get look a little bit weird or, or stuff like that. So it looks pretty stable. We're not getting colors bouncing around or dancing or like jittering or, or anything like that. Um, so this is a, a big advantage, like especially if you're doing OpenCL, you don't need to put more fields, like unnecessary color fields onto your um, graphics card. You could see reading stuff out, like just reading the velocity field from the simulation slowed things down quite a bit. Um, if we had to re pull out a color field as well as the smoke or density or temperature field, then we're just grabbing like four gigabytes of data from the card, uh, the graphics card each frame. So things get really slow once you do that. So if you can, um, it's a good idea to try to optimize things or work a little bit more um, efficiently or whatever, uh, like in this kind of, uh, I don't know. Cheating. <laughs> it's the cheat zone again today. So as these things mix around and uh, collide, that's going to be a pretty interesting um, part of the of the simulation. So we'll let this uh, keep simulating, I guess. Started to get a little bit slower just because that velocity field, um, when I increased the resolution of everything, the velocity field it was taking like five seconds to pull out of the simulation, probably was taking 10 or 20 seconds per, per frame now. Um, looks like we might be getting some problems with the colors. Like there, you can see little particles or spheres. We'll fix, hopefully fix that um, after we evaluate things. But we'll just let this simulate, maybe give it one or two more minutes um, to smash into each other and see what happens. I'll be right back. I started to, to touch. So it looks, I don't know, it's pretty cool already, but we're very far from uh, being finished. It's probably, if I had to estimate this, we'll probably spend like one more hour on this today. It was gonna be a little bit shorter of a stream compared to the longer sessions or whatever it's doing. 
got, I think I got carried away yesterday or whatever. It was like three, three and a half hours or something. So we see, we obviously see some problems. Um, overall, it's going a little bit too slow for like prototyping phase of, of, of everything, like just setting everything up. Um, so I'm just going to adjust some settings and uh, work at a lower resolution and, and move forward. So let's go back up to a higher resolution, just one point or point zero one five. Um, Thirteen million voxels. It should be pretty quick. Um, then I'm just going to go up to frame twenty six, um, and we'll start to try to examine some of those areas that weren't getting all of the color uh, transferred over. So I think one issue arises because of this use max uh, extrapolate cells. Um, so if we don't use extrapolated, it's gonna look for a p-scale value on the points, kind of like the gas particle to field nodes we were using. Um, then extrapolated will basically say, just pad or take this value and extrapolate it out to voxels. The cell is just another name they use for a voxel. Um, so if we want to extend that region, we could go up more cells. Um, if you're not, if you don't want to run into this problem, you can just turn that off. And then this will just always fully, because we're telling it extrapolated, we'll just say, regardless of where you are in the simulation, um, where you are in the container, always find the nearest um, particle and extrapolate that value out to where you are. So you're trying to put the Pokemon game on a floppy disk in your in your gameplay. <laughs> it's always magical to, to figure out how video games work or are coded and stuff like that. Um, so everything else I think is, is good there. The other thing we might want to do is, because these particles are so lightweight, talking about the floppy disk, like we, we could put them on a thumb drive or anything with low data. Um, storage so we could make like 333 points you have to be careful a little bit because every frame it's going to create 333 points um but basically the more points we have the more smoothly or the more definition um we can have of our color values sometimes it's a good idea too just to add a little bit of a jitter um not even anything <clears throat> too noticeable, but this is kind of just like blurring or moving them around a little bit at the start. So instead of being completely flat, they'll get pushed around a little bit differently uh, with the, the velocity, if, if that makes sense. Um, we should be good. I'm going to move this over to the size of the domain. Um, basically, I don't want this volume to be like resized every frame. I, I, I think it might introduce some flickering or problems. So we'll just leave the voxels and everything at this uh, locked into the size of the domain. You'd see it's a pretty low resolution volume. Um, so we don't need to worry too much about that not being optimized or whatever. So now because of our extrapolation, will always be getting values in, in all of these voxels. Um, we should just do it again with those changes and uh, see what happens. So I remember when I was young, I was like, me and my brother got the Nintendo 64 and I didn't know like how graphics generally got better. I just knew like the cartridges were bigger and stuff. <laughs> like, 
So I was like, it must just be that they have more storage. They can store more images on the on the cartridge. I thought that uh, like all of the content uh, on those video games were pre-rendered and like just like a slideshow would just so show you which which image it needed to show you. So I was like, oh, that's that's how video games work. You just are controlling like a slideshow. It's kind of like. Uh, if you ever played Myst or Riven or those games, like that was essentially the, what what I was thinking in my mind, where it's just like pre-rendered content, pre-rendered images, and you just interact with it, like click click around and everything. So we should be able to. <laughs> yeah, I've, I don't know if I'm a full master, but I've made progress. So we have fix that issue of losing smoke details. Um, so we're in good shape in that regards. Everything's a lot faster now because we're um, working at the slightly different lower resolution. So we should be pretty good. The one thing um, I think we might be getting some problems with our color volume just being a little bit too too low of a resolution. Like we might we might be able to capture some more detail, some more interesting stuff happening in that area. Um, so I'm gonna try this again. So this is we're kind of like double around double the size of our um, source, our underlying simulation. Um, then I might do even more particles per, per frame. It's possible we can maybe make some optimizations I'm not 100% sure if this volume from attribute supports VDB volumes. It looks like we slowed down a little bit um, when I increased that resolution. The, the extrapolated um, toggle that I turned on will slow down the performance of this node. And then just the amount of particles that I'm making slows it down a little bit as well. So I'm just going to hit cancel. Um, I'm going to go out of the viewport so we're not visualizing anything. Um, I'm just going to click this. Sometimes they give you warnings or like little hints if it supports a, a VDB or not. They don't have any caveat, so I'll assume it does. Um, what we can do is take this density We've already converted it to a VDB. Um, it's already kind of the size that we need it to, um, the size that we need it to be. We could just merge it. Um, and then these names here, if I do uh, cd.x, um, these individual scalar fields can actually be used to make like an RGB color. So we have three densities that just fit one value, but we'll go from that and we'll name them to CD, X, Y, and Z, and then merge them all together. So now we have our three float volumes, and uh, then we can just do our VDB vector merge again. So now we have a vector CD volume, and it's already, we could just leave it as a color there. Um, and then because this is sparse, I don't know, see if it, it looks like maybe this node tricked me and it might not work with uh, what I was trying to do. It's 
so we have one more option that we can try to speed things up. Uh, we can just do maybe VDB from particles. Um, make everything a little bit smaller. And uh, this one, instead of doing distance, we can use this to look at that color information. And then it looks like it's getting it. So this, the extrapolation isn't happening as as far. You could, this is kind of working the same way that that extrapolation happens, but the speed in which the, these will cook should be um, a lot faster. Might be, I don't know if it's possible. Oh, it might be the, just the, the visualization Looks like this still wasn't working, so we'll get, stay with that. Um, so I just have to split these back into, maybe it's because it's looking for, for that name. Sorry if I'm moving, <laughs> moving too quickly. But um, basically because this was set to CD colon star, it wanted them to be split out into individual fields. So we can just adjust it this way. Um, We'll just try to optimize things a little bit more. Um, so this time I'm looking for more detail in, in our color, like less uh, blockiness. Uh, some of this stuff, when it got to a certain distance, I mean, you probably won't notice it in the render depending on the effect you're trying to do, but it, it would be nice to preserve some sharper contrast like between the different colors that we're trying to mix. So you can already see with the difference of those two frames, the, the extra kind of detail that we're, we're getting. So I'll just let this play out a little bit longer. Um, we'll observe the collision again and just compare the different iterations. Um, and then I'm probably gonna make a few more tweaks just to the underlying motion of the simulation using the turbulence that we set up. Um, this stuff here is just looking a little bit bad right now. Uh, so I'll try to fix our motion if, as long as our colors are, are working properly. Um, and then hopefully move in to rendering pretty pretty soon. It will be Redshift today. I'm gonna. I haven't spent enough time with with um, rendering volumes with the new version 3.0 of Redshift. So hopefully it's it's gotten better. Made some improvements. I think part of the issue is just on my part, not uh, not knowing the parameters or just spending enough time trying to to learn it. So it looks like we're getting a little bit better representation of these these colors now. So let's stop that where it is. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this extra stuff that we didn't need just to keep keep our scene laid out pretty simple. Um, So I'm just visualizing up here, so it's going to be quicker to tweak and 
visualize the simulation for just making shape changes. There's no reason to, to spend all the extra time doing that color. Um, so I think this turbulence overall, just go to a scale of one. Um, I'm gonna bring that minimum higher. So I'm trying to get rid of this stuff here that's it's too, just too much of it is getting pulled off the, the volume, I think. Um, and then maybe my pulse length, I want to have the noise update more slowly. So I'll make the pulse update, the pulse length longer. Um, let's go up a little bit on that one as well. And I think, I think we're good. Um, maybe the cooling rate, I'll turn that off. take a look at this new the new motion of the simulation so th I think everything was just getting a little bit too blurry or too sloppy before so what I'm trying to do is preserve like bigger details or bigger shapes uh, basically I might want to do even a little bit less turbulence. Maybe I'll make it a little bit larger of a of a scale that's spinning things around at. Um, let's try to add the vortex confinement. So we'll grab this parameter again. Oops. Just link it up so we're I like to do that just so I have one place to enable or disable uh, open open CL um, and then this guy like I was doing in some of the other streams I usually like to do the repeat solver um, and then just do a bunch of small incremental passes of confinement instead of one one larger one I think it tends to give you a little bit more detailed, like preserves even the finer detail doing it that way, where if you just do one iteration and slam the value super high, it will just strip out some of the motion. So let's take another look at this. So if you have your settings optimized or whatever, this is kind of nice because I'm not even like caching this cache right now you've seen is the SAP solver cache, but all of it, everything up here is all just real time simulation display, playback, playback, everything is pretty quick. So I think just because I eliminated my cooling, this stuff is just looking a little bit too thick. I think it could be pretty nice. Some of this, some of that, uh, the structures of those turbulence looks a little odd. Um, might, I think it's just either too big or too small. It's kind of looking just like a much bigger um, event like a mushroom cloud or something. I was trying to, I'm trying to do more of like an ink, ink style. You have this stuff in an aquarium or a fluid tank or something like that. So it's, you don't expect to see as much of those. I don't know. I think this is going to be pretty cool with these kind of cloud shapes or whatever popping off. I think we're going to be good with this one. So let's do this. Um, set up our cache.
let me just check here what um, Redshift is saying about these. I'm not sure about that clean background parameter. <laughs> I guess we'll find out what happens. Um, so I'm hoping, I don't know if Redshift wants these to be separate grids or a vector volume. Um, and then this guy is named density, so he should be good with that. Um, and then just to keep everything quick, I'm just going to do that path. Um, I might make this a little bit smaller. Um, and then I'm just going to do a primitive node at the very end for VDB. Uh, to store 16-bit values. So this will optimize our storage space a little bit. Um, we should be good. Let's go up another version. Save in background. Whoops. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it yet. Let's go back. Kill that one. So I've, I just wanted to bump up the resolution a little bit. Um, we are still working at like, I don't know what would be, um, real time or low resolution. So we'll go up to maybe a little bit higher than that. And then try this. So we have this guy going in the background. We should see that H batch pop up pretty soon. Maybe I'll just leave this on top. Just keep an eye on it. We could start trying to either look at these results, load from disk. Um, might be dropping frames now that the GPU is kicking into to overdrive. Um, so I just organize this stuff a little bit better. And uh, we could start setting up or kind of dialing in um, our redshift settings or just not necessarily dialing in, but just setting them up. The 11 gig is, you should still be pretty safe with 11. Sometimes it helps if you have two, maybe if you have two GPUs, Julian. Um, so if you, the OpenCL stuff can only use, utilize one CPU, one uh, GPU, but you can set the simulation, the OpenCL simulations in Houdini to happen on a different graphics card than your viewport your main like desktop environment and everything is using um you'll see here that like my obs is using some some of my gpu my houdini graphical session is using some and plays using some so if you split that out uh that can be useful so if you do um i don't think we even have to do that anymore it's they added it as a preference which is nice i think all the way at the bottom miscellaneous OpenCL device, then you can assign it to a different um, GPU that isn't being used as your display graphics card. So if you have like two, two graphics cards in your machine, that's a, a trick. I just have the one in this, so I'm kind of stuck. Um, so we'll start replacing things. With Redshift, we'll do the RS Lite. Um, Sometimes I just do this to, it's a quick way just to grab the settings and uh, start with them.
the nether, the lights are in the same position, pointed the same direction, everything like that. Um, I think we can just delete that. Delete the Houdini spotlight. This one I might want to change the spotlight to get started. Uh, we'll start with the material network. Um, do the RS redshift material. We don't need it to be an actual material. We'll be doing volume. Just wired it up like that. We have density. Um, so it looks like you can use this color channel in all of these different um, shader models or areas or whatever. So it looks like we can add a color channel for emission or absorption or density, or this scatters kind of density. Um, so we'll start it off with, do um, you have four GPUs, Julian? You're doing a lot of rendering with them. So we should be good with that. Um, just assign the material. Plug it in. Um, set up the Redshift render wrap. <laughs> just using them as a furnace. So I, th I thought that they had added something with um, multiple scattering for, for, for volumes, but I can't seem to find it. Maybe this GI stuff is, they're basically saying it applies to volumes. I'd read in like the release notes that um, they were supporting multiple, or it might be this contribution scale on my light. We'll give it a try once we get started. I'm not launching the render right now just because it's gonna, it might like blow up my GPU sim. Like this, all of this memory that, that I'm using with HBatch might uh, get consumed by Redshift and uh, cause problems. So we'll just cruise along with our visualization. Maybe we could set up a camera. We don't have one yet. So just take a look at this and see what kind of performance we're getting. We have 42, almost two seconds of animation. It looks like we're getting maybe 10, 12 second frames or something like that, for simulation time. So just play around with this visualization. Uh, it depends a lot what stuff they're doing. They, they mix and match a lot of it. Um, I don't know how much I can, can talk about it as it's probably somewhat like proprietary information. <laughs> But um, I think if you look at their breakdowns or articles and stuff like that, you can uh, find some information about it. There was, um, in the Discord, I, I put a link to that presentation that they gave about Plume a while back. Um, they talk a little bit about their, their rendering pipeline for fluid simulations in that uh, presentation. So unfortunately, I don't think that there's an easy way to like link up or get one-to-one -one matches with this any of these settings with Redshift. We'll just link them up and kind of see see what happens or see how far we get with them. So we're up to 50 frame 52 of our simulation.
So our disc usage is still pretty light because we did do that conversion um, to half float. So that saves us some, some disk space. And then I think just reading and writing it back from disk becomes a little bit faster. So I think we might be getting close to starting to render it. Um, I'm just gonna let this simulation go a little bit longer. We have 60 frames now. Um, we'll probably let it go one minute, one or two minutes longer, uh, and then launch some renders. You guys have any questions about this stuff? This isn't necessarily the best approach to use for every situation. Um, I'm just sharing it because like for quick iterations, quick feedback, it's the best one that I've found. Um, also, if you already have like a, a simulation that you've set up without color, it's, a, it's you could see how quick and easy it was to set this up. Um, just whatever particles you add, it will color them. It's pretty cool. You can also like, I already cached it out, but like I could just put geometry in in my simulation and whenever these things get near it um, that color would would uh, get like transferred over or bleed into the the volumes or whatever so it's super art directable or like easy to uh, to manipulate sometimes this visualization it's not the, the easiest way to see stuff this guy you can get cool visualizations of the color um, you might need to strip out the density field if you want to make sure that it's getting the raw color values or whatever. Sometimes you can do um, a blur as like a post process. It just depends if you want to try to keep these. Usually I'll start with keeping these crisp edges. Kind of looks like a Voronoi pattern. This is basically what it is, is like the closest point. But um, if you do see some flickering or just too much contrast between the different particles, then it, it might be a good idea to add like one or two passes of, of a blur. So if I do just do, um, with VDB, for whatever reason, they call their blur smooth. This is just the Gaussian smooth or, or um, it's like Photoshop blur, it's, it's all the same, same stuff. So you can do different voxel radius and get different smoothness or, or different results. Um, if I did this up at the top here. So what I did with that group is just say only smooth or blur the color field. Um, so it's all the detail, don't blur, don't touch the density field. Um, so you'd see we, because we are blurring, you get a little bit of bleeding onto this, but it depends a lot on your rendering and, and stuff like that. Um, generally like this, just people get tricked by it and they think it's bounce light, like color bleeding um, from because of the light hitting it and doing a diffuse bounce or volume bounce or whatever. Um, you could also just go in a smaller radius and uh, we just get a different blur amount and play with things that way. So it looks like visually it's kind of hard to see those, the results, but you can see it a little bit better with the slice, what's, uh, what's, what's happening with it. Um, so I think it's, Go ahead with a render. So we're at frame 78. 
I'm actually I'm just gonna go fill up my my water. We'll do a quick render after that. So if I was smarter, I might have submitted this simulation to run on a different, on my other computer using uh, HQ, the, the Houdini farm manager, but I didn't think about it. Uh, it's also possible that, um, that uh, GPU on that machine, I just have two GTX 1070s, so it might not have been enough memory. I think it's like an 8GB card. So we can just leave our... Maybe we just want to put our display flag here. Um, we can move it around if we do want to render with the blur and everything like that. But for right now, try it. Um, just save it again in case Redshift is known to, to crash or freeze, lock things up. Especially the the version that you were talking about, Julian, is a crash for sure. Uh, so we'll go to the Redshift render view. Set up our prop. So I think it's copying the volumes over to the GPU right now. Maybe I need to put in a camera. Re reframe the scene. I'm getting an alpha channel, just not a uh, color. Just try getting rid of that for right now. So uh, if you guys have any advice, <laughs> help me out with these uh, with these parameters just to make sure I'm doing things right. We have our density, VDB volume. Maybe just try isol just isolating only density. We just have the density. We'll move the render flag there. Let's see just if we get any color. It's kind of weird that it was black. We can see it with the alpha channel. I feel like I've had this happen with with Redshift before, but I don't remember what it was that fixed it. My light is just like too too dark. Just add a grid. So it might just be the the shaders and set up to like reflect light. It's just letting light pass through or something, it looks like. It's just catching the light, but it isn't manipulating it at all.
this is why I was putting off using uh, Redshift with the to render volumes. I'm just not as comfortable with it compared to uh, compared to Mantra. All right, so I think we just needed some uh, information in the absorption channel. Um, it's a little counterintuitive, I guess, just how this, this stuff is working. All right, so we, we got a result. Let's go back a little bit, set that to default, and let's try putting our color into the absorption coefficient. just disable that nothing <laughs> it didn't like it so the other thing I don't know is my camera I believe is not lined up or maybe I forgot to add one so let's go in and position that I think I just thought that I was moving around the camera, but I wasn't. We'll just go into this frame right here. And then let's try to troubleshoot this color not being picked up. So I'll do the vector split. So this is going to go from one single vector three color volume into the three individual components. We'll see if this is part of the problem. You think the light contribution is a good idea? Let's uh, get all the way down there. This is definitely helping. It's getting more of the, uh, it's behaving more like an actual volume. So let's go into here. Let's just try this in the scatter color channel. I think it's gonna work. No, it doesn't work. So let's try going back to keeping it as uh, colors that were all in, in the same something. <laughs> it, it kind of worked. I think I know I think I know what, what, what they're doing. So I think because my volumes are different resolutions, like you can kind of see this is a copy of my uh, volume of this resolution and then the smaller, lower resolution color volume, they moved it over. So I think in their shader, they're not compensating for like voxel uh, scale. So we can just do, um, the VDB resample is a pretty good one to use. Uh, so we have density and color. We're just gonna split them out to make it a little bit clearer as to what's going on. Um, we'll do split this out. So now we just have density in that input um, and color in the other one. And then instead of the way that this resample works, like sometimes you can set it to adjust the resolution using a slider. Reference VDB will say, try to find the, match the resolution of the other input. So our voxel size is 0 0.0075 after this operation, but earlier our voxel sizes were different for density and color. So I think that's what's moving that, that over. Um, 
And then we can just do a merge. Because this stripped out our density field. There's some kind of funky wiring happening there. I'm just going to move the display flag back to a different area. Let's see if my speculation was, I guess, right. Yeah, so it looks like that was the issue with the grids not, not lining up, that they had different transforms. So let's play around in the shader again. See what what happens. We'll do take that color out and put it into the absorption. I don't know if these values are updating. You might you might need to like reboot Redshift to get it to uh, to get it to to know that I changed the color channel applications. Yeah, so I think now, because it's in the absorption channel, it will work a little bit differently, like attenuating the light instead of, uh, this one is like reflecting the light back, basically. I think for right now, having it in the scatter color channel would be better. You think that that would be a better? Even though this isn't a SOP level, like the, the shader changes will pick up if you change the SOP level updates. I'm always hesitant to mess around with too much of the underworkings of Redshift. <laughs> Because I don't know it. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, uh, I'll try turning that on. Um, so we'll reduce that. Increase this one. So I think we're getting somewhat reasonable looking results. Um, let's just see what we can get. So this guy, I'm going to set it to 20. And just to get more shadows. Um, I think that it's kind of how it works where this absorption will be um, blocking more of the light, basically. I'm just going to get rid of that ground. Just to there's no reason to, to waste time rendering it or whatever. Uh, so this out. Julian, you're saying to turn on the SOP level. It's in, I, I don't remember what tab they put it in. Ah, the IPR tab. Thank you. Very, should be very nice. All right. So we'll spin up another render. I'm just gonna boost my light to get a little bit better highlights. I might want to do a little bit of that blurring that I was talking about. Um, just to make sure that 
we don't see too many like blocky kind of artifacts. And maybe this interpolation, uh, if you make it a little bit better than linear, it should give you uh, more smoothly like up when you upscale the colors, it should do it a little bit more smoothly basically. So that should be good. I might make a, f <clears throat> a few more tweaks. I think I think my uh, settings were maybe a little bit too aggressive. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not super pumped right now with it. So we'll go down to 12 with that. So I think it's gonna look better, more treating it more lightweight, like a, a gas or something like that that you can see through more easily. It's a bit bright. Maybe something like that is kind of nice. Let's see what happens with this shadow density scale. So this could be, it could be pretty good. Got it looking a little bit better. Let's save the file just in case something happens. Just make these chains a little bit easier to, to understand what's going on. Um, so you're talking about with remapping the maximum density kind of like to flatten stuff out. Like it's, kind of, it's what I do with the ramps sometimes is like notch the upper level so essentially it's like doing a d d gamma i guess operation gives you like a fluffier look sometimes so i'm going to just do the bucket style rendering um i'm going to just try to do some quick optimizations or whatever Whoops. It was already looks like it was rendering pretty quickly. Um, so this GI, let's just turn that down to two for right now. Um, I don't know, usually I'm a little bit <laughs> greedy with those settings. I'll just multiply that by a number somewhat high. Um, we'll do those kind of settings. Um, forget how far we simulated to. I think it was at least frame 70. Um, so I th think we can... Let me see if I can get this uh, going on the... grab my other machine. See what happens. <laughs> Did it work? So it's on the it's on the farm. See how quickly these frames render. We we might be able to get a better animation. Um, going I don't know, it might Getting like 10 seconds of frame, it's somewhat promising. Um, so we'll, if you guys have any questions about this overall stuff, we could do that. But um, looks like I need to look into maybe what this parameter is doing. I think it's kind of like saying pre-molt the 
density or scatter fields uh, multiply the color channel by that those like scalar fields that you're visualizing um, then it seems like this was a, almost a little bit of a gotcha your color volume has to be the match the same resolution as your other volumes the mantra I think is a little bit more forgiving um, sometimes you'll do like your velocity field at a lower resolution and your color your temperature those can be lower resolutions um, the majority of the detail just comes from the actual uh, density like your primary uh, channel so these these uh, the what is it called I forget <laughs> I lost my train of thought we we'll just go into um, today's folder. I don't know if it made my my render directory. It might have been because I tried. I forgot to make a scenes. Let's just see where this redshift is putting them. I might have messed up on my uh, my node parameters. Oof, it was the luck. So I don't know why I need to fix my permissions. Somehow my permissions aren't getting set. That's why it looked like my frames were going so quickly. Let's just give this one another uh, another try. Let's just go into this job reschedule. We'll try to get some renders or something happening pretty pretty quickly. Seems like using this stage thing to work. I'm not. I don't think red like you have to do a bunch of stuff to get Redshift to show up within it, uh, but hopefully that happens soon. Cause like that, then you can just use the Redshift IPR or whatever as your viewport. That would be pretty pretty amazing. So I think I don't know what what the typical way is to grab volumes or whatever, but you, you just have to... Maybe I'll try the, the file node. So this guy, you can do it with... Um, the Houdini Karma render that's like a it's CPU based still so it's not as fast um, and then the storm is like Pixar's uh, internal render but it doesn't support um, volumes so we just won't see anything or whatever but eventually like Redshift right now you have to add a bunch of environment variables but hopefully they'll get it easier um, more accessible and then you can just do it using a drop down and get stuff happening, updating like super fast. Let's see what happens with these. Uh... So it looks like it works now. We still didn't get any, no results. Let's investigate this a little bit further. Is it still saying it's not, it's not running them?
I might not have given it enough time after I did my permissions modification. That permissions change or whatever takes a few seconds or a minute or something to, to happen. Um, so let's just try it one more time. Reschedule him, get him going again, requeue. Maybe they weren't, they were appearing further down. Where I have to mark those frames to, to run again. Sorry guys, <laughs> really blundering quite a bit on, on today's. It looks like it worked this time. So I might just need to requeue those frames that said they succeeded earlier. Did it work? The hell is going on? All right. Might bail out of uh, that part of the, the presentation. Um, so instead, what I'm going to do is just go into this out context. Um, we'll just do a quick one to, to M play. Maybe. I'm just going to increase this threshold so we, our, our frames should render quicker. Um, then let's try this one out, see what happens. So it's happening, they're rendering pretty quick here. I don't know what was going on with my, I still need to, I was updating the redshift on the HQ or whatever, so it might have been a, an issue with that. Are these frames really all empty? How could it be? So it looks like we did a good job matching the viewport. It's, it looks pretty similar to what we, we were visualizing in the flipbooks earlier somewhat. Hopefully it will get a little bit more interesting stuff happening uh, a, few, a few frames in. So I think the biggest slowness or wasted time whatever right now each frame is like just transferring the volumes from my my hard drive to back to my graphics card to render them but then the render happens pretty quickly probably also should have just done a lower resolution render i might actually just go in and try that right now so let's do main we'll do a quarter of the resolution um We'll see, see what happens. I feel like I've done it before where um, at least my, I'm not dropping as many frames on OBS anymore. Um, but I think you can get this redshift going pretty quick if you knock down the resolution and stuff like that enough. So now we're getting closer to real time, or I don't know, not not real time, but a, a frame a second, or I don't know, a frame every 10 seconds.
So I was updating my um, stream schedule, the Streamlabs panel on my, my Twitch. I did scale back a little bit of the schedule for this upcoming week. Um, I took off Monday and, and Wednesday, so probably won't be coming back again till Friday. Just to, I, I don't know, just needed some more time to try things out before demoing them and that kind of stuff. Um, focus on, <laughs> trying to focus a little bit more on quality. And I don't know, I, I was moving a little bit too quickly before maybe, where it's just too, <laughs> too much information for that short amount of time or whatever for people. So uh, that would just keep an eye on that panel or whatever, I might change it. But for right now, I'm planning not to, to do one until Friday. Um, we'll probably try another cool zone stream, another Instagram style daily art or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to put them on YouTube or whatever, but I mean, if people aren't consuming them that quickly, there's no reason for me to, I'd rather kind of scale back and just focus on the quality and, and, uh, organization and stuff like that of them. And I don't know, that was my mindset. And then just. For me personally, with work and stuff like that, it was just becoming a little bit too much to to try to balance and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so this was the one from Friday. Uh, I did spend some time adjusting things and stuff like that, but this coming Friday will be. It won't, it won't look exactly like this, but it'll be a similar idea of like something that you might see on Instagram the cool zone type of image. I uh, went in with this concrete shader or whatever. I feel like that made made this thing look better. Uh, it's almost like the, the concrete stone pour, like it's almost like his skin pours or whatever. It ended up working pretty well in that sense. Um, still planning to tweak things a little bit and try to add like some detail into this fracture. I like that it's uh, line, like the compositionally like diagonal line across the image. Yeah, and just contrast like black and white versus all these colors. Um, it's a very eye-catching thing, but I think I want to add like a little bit of detail, maybe with a boolean or something like that, to get um, more of like a rock. Like you, if you actually like hit this, split this rock like statue in half with a hammer, you'd see like some jagged edges, some stuff protruding, um, but I want to keep it very close to this line, but I just feel like the line, it just reads like someone took two different images um, and then in Photoshop put them together. For The way that I lit it is not helping that much because there's not like shadow showing that. Um, so I'm just going to try to get some exposed, jagged, some jaggedies. Raggedy jaggedies. Add some jaggedies to Johan, Johannes Sebastian. So it's, with Redshift, it's pretty cool with the color fields. We're getting some interesting, interesting looking stuff. Yeah, so I'm still gonna tweak this a little bit, hopefully. Um, this is like some of the earlier versions. Um, so I, I feel like this more messy, like I just basically increased that advection um, iterations of the noise that I was doing in the for loop for this. That was like pushing the, the lines along the noise. Um, Still going back and forth if I like this depth of field or not. I think it's cool to accentuate like the eye features. It kind of knocks down, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the way that this, some of that stuff looks with depth of field. Like you kind of miss out on a lot of interesting stuff happening there. And you could see before and after I was just playing around with the shader for, for him, what a big difference or a big improvement it was. So 
So we'll let this render blast off a little bit more. Um, which files are you talking about, Julian? From yesterday? They're almost touching. Or you're talking about the changes that I was making to that statue. Oh, the ones from yesterday. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I just wasn't that, <laughs> I wasn't that happy with the uh, results, but I'll put, I, I'll try to put where we left off after that stream. Um, I was also just going back or forth about whether to upload it to, to YouTube or not. Cause like, I feel like the Twitch VODs are a little bit less permanent because they time out or they get yeeted after like 40, 45 days or something like that. But um, I don't know, I just wasn't that happy with the, I feel like I made some poor, I gave some poor advice or poor decisions during that, that stream. I just wasn't that happy with the end result, I guess. Or the, it was just a bad idea of compositionally, like overall creative direction uh, wasn't the best planning on my part, I guess, to try to do that smaller shockwave. Um, but yeah, I'll, I could put them into the Discord, uh, the version five or six, uh, whatever we ended up leaving off with uh, yesterday. And then I'm still working on that one that I was, I was sh showing at the start of this stream. Um, where did this go? There's too many things going on. Um, Yeah, so this was after I reworked the shot. Um, so I'm still playing around with this, just going in a little bit of a different direction. Um, but I realized I started getting a lot of the interesting kind of stuff that we were talking about, where it was like the more spiky leading like avalanche stuff. So it's cool to see those like in a different part of the simulation. Um, and then just overall, like I was saying at the start of today, just optimizing the usage of this container. Um, and then I think I'll be able to get away with letting this stuff get cropped out by it. Um, because everything will be like a perfect cube, it won't look as much like an unintentional artifact. It will look like an, in, an, an intentional feature. Um, so I think it, it could end up looking pretty cool more like motion design, graphic design kind of uh, shot shot design, I guess, or composition. Um, so that should be quite nice. I'm hoping. Uh, so there was like the old. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to find it. Okay, yeah. So there was this guy that did the. <laughs> this art in like 1990 that was, uh, I don't know if he did it using Microsoft Paint or something like that, but um, that's kind of, I'll kind of end up with something like that with the uh, terrain going through the edge of stuff. But it'll, it'll be a little bit more interesting because you'll see like higher and lower density areas and stuff like that. Um, so that, that part should be pretty interesting, but it's, I, I think it's a cool idea to have it sliced off at the edge, it kind of ended up working. It got lucky with that one. Sometimes it's just like you have to try something enough times using different approaches until you get lucky with, you make enough unintentional mistakes or <laughs> decisions that you, you end up with good results. It's a lot of like, even that kind of stuff translates to real life. If you were to simulate, like try to reproduce these jets mixing um, with photography and stuff, you'd like, let's set up a fan, put like t two fans around it. Let's see what that does to add detail to it. Let's, I don't know, turn down like the temperature of the room that, that you're performing the, you, you're like shooting these at each other. You could, uh, try different like powders inside of these. Um, I don't know. It's just a bunch of, you're just trying to try different things and see what looks good. But sometimes it's a good idea just with Houdini to do. Don't get locked into the same approach of just repeating the same steps and expecting different results or whatever. It's hard to gauge like 
how far of a step back to take. It's, that's always the problem I get caught into is like, is it just changing the noises on my simulation? Is it just changing the scale of the particles or redesigning the whole concept? Like it's, I don't know, it's, it's easy to get stuck in, in, in the lost in the sauce. So it's looking pretty good when it's starting to mix with the shadows. Like I'm pretty impressed with this shadowing and, and everything like that with the redshift. Um, so we'll save this file I've saved a few times, but we'll do version two or whatever. It's a pretty straightforward thing, um, setup or whatever. We'll just stop my render at that frame. So I stop dropping frames on the stream. Um, yeah, so you guys play around with this. It should be a pretty fun, quick one to do to, to load up and run. Um, could be cool to change colors. So on this stuff, I never updated the source particles when I was emitting colors, but it could be cool to animate, like go through the different hues or something like that over the, the time. So as you're blowing the smoke, it's changing uh, from the source. Or even just instead of doing bounding box, doing like blue and red smokes. It's always like a classic composition or ink take tank kind of mixing. Um, maybe playing around with um, viscosity. If you're really going for a ink mixing look, could be cool. This viscosity is just on the pyro solver um, tab or completely doing different s scenarios without the jets blowing. Give those color palettes a, a try that I <laughs> put in the other files you get some some interesting results it was save the file um it'll be in the discord see you guys sometime later this week all right